polarization uh, uh, paper. He's a professor in Los Angeles. Through uh, Zoom, he said that uh, social media is not causing political polarization. It reflects the social or the political polarization in the community. So we're going to talk about international balances of power and their impact on the structure and performance of social media networks. We have with us uh, Dr. Bruce Mutsvairo, Dr. Mohammed Eraji, Mr. Nigel Nyamutumbu, and Mr. Mohammed Al-Bouzidi. So we're going to talk about the international conflicts uh, and how they impact knowledge production. So as we've seen with Cambridge Analytica, uh, these uh, networks are used ideologically in order to serve the interests of international uh, players, especially during international crisis and conflict, which causes ideological and political polarization. We've also uh, heard Professor Manuel Castell uh, talking about this dynamic that creates a very complicated uh, network and there are no ready-made solutions for it. We have with us Dr. Bruce Motzweiro from Holland and uh, he is mainly focused on three issues, interaction between journalism and democracy, also freedom of the press and safety of professors in times uh, in uh, journalists in times of conflicts, and digital and data dissident citizen journalists and activists use of online-based technologies, including social media platforms, to influence political change under the prevailing pre misinformation ecology. Decoding detailed participation through the promotion of social practices. Welcome, Professor Motsvairo. You have the Thank floor. You. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers um, uh, for inviting me. Um, one common feature that is often associated with digital technologies pertains to how they are seen to be transforming the global economy or bringing uh, the much needed innovation to modern day societies. To this end, uh, the number of people who own smartphones or those who have access to the internet has been rising uh, in the majority world uh, or what some prefer to call the global south. Yet, it is rather the lack of uh, region or country specific Statist, uh, uh, understandings rather on how uh, our interactions with tech driven societal transformations, including the interdependence of communication infrastructures, that I feel has received minimum attention. While high rates of social media use continue to be registered in non Western societies, it's the idea that technology comes with progressiveness and modernity that can no longer be sustained. And as computer systems are being lined up to replace human intelligence, I'm wondering who is to blame? What got us here in the first place? Is it just the tech companies that should take the blame? Uh, or we should be asking ourselves, what about generations of constantly bored people who have been sold a dummy to believe uh, Henry Jenkins' participatory culture bodes well with, uh, with their context. I mean, who seriously sees themselves as participants? Um, what does participating really mean? Uh, and I'm referring here to uh, Henry Jenkins' uh, participatory culture uh, theory. Uh, Liking a message, uh, uh, being an influencer, are you really participating uh, or you have been made to believe you are? 
uh, are you a participant or are you a consumer? Thinking as hard as I could think, I have to, I've had to come to terms with the fact that perhaps there is no solution to this. Uh, we as a society have been enslaved. We have been hoodwinked. Uh, obviously, hegemonic forces have or seem to have won over us. The same forces that Adorno, Hochheimer, and Herbert Marcus warned us were the brains behind the cultural industries that were meant to, uh, uh, to use media messages to manipulate us. Today, they tell us they, offer, they only offer a service. They apparently have no power. Uh, they are just a mere mediator. Uber is, up, is apparently there to make our lives better. Airbnb is good for us. Really. The point being, who is not a consumer? Is there any way to escape ubiquitous consumerism that these platforms uh, promote? Have we forgotten uh, about the power that we have? Is it because of this inescapable social dilemma that we have decided to give in? Yes, maybe it's too late to disconnect now. Uh, obviously, digital detoxing is in the long-term answer. Yet, I believe we have an obligation to educate current and future generations on the dangers of social media. We have stood up against colonialism. Where was Facebook then? We stood up against all the isms and chisms, as Bob Marley called them. Henceforth, the idea that technology is an enabler can no longer stay unchallenged. Maybe if Genny Morosov was right when he talked about the net uh, a delusion in 2011. There won't be any progress until I believe we realize social media platforms aren't meant uh, for us. We need to go back to the basics. Let's go back to the communities in Africa, the Arab world, Asia, Latin America, and for once, listen to these people. Facebook has given us a voice. No, but we already had a voice before Facebook. There will never be voices or opportunities to voice our concerns uh, on Facebook bigger than what we did as a society uh, in the pre-Facebook years. The point being let's abandon the bubble that platforms give us new knowledge. We are the knowledge. Real knowledge is with the, uh, is with the people. Collaborating with the communities therefore offers us an opportunity to think about where we got it wrong in the first place. Yes, we have written books and we continue to have aspirations to write books, but our source of knowledge, I believe, is in the people, particularly the elders in the village, who perhaps cannot operate a smartphone, but they have lived to see how deceitful technologies from guns to online games can be. People have historically played uh, an instrumental role in advocating social change instead of, uh, instead of simply telling everybody to adopt these technologies, it's important uh, instead to question, to question them like uh, uh, many scholars including Castells uh, 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 before us has been doing for much of his uh, adult life. On the African continent, radio just 48% Television, 35% are still preferred, according to recent, well, 2021 statistics, sources of news. Only 22% of the continent relies on social media for news. So it means here we got some work to do, and I believe technology, technological divides are real. Last but not least, certainly social media isn't the only source of knowledge, or isn't even the source of knowledge. The religious leader, the community leader, I believe are sources of knowledge tried and tested uh, uh, that we as a society sadly despise them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Busabairo.
and uh, for the for provoking um, uh, paper. Um, uh, well, and now we'll turn to Dr. Muhammad Arraji. Now we we'll listen to Dr. Muhammad Arraji, who will try to explore the strategies of social media networks in producing ideologies and rhetorical dominance. The study of Israeli discourse on Twitter and Facebook. Dr. Mohammed Arraji is a researcher in Al Jazeera Center for Studies overseas, the Media Studies Program, and he runs the Al Jazeera uh, Journal for Media and Communication. He edits a Lubab issued by Al Jazeera Center for Studies 2019-2022. He is an academic uh, supervisor in Al Jazeera Program for field studies. Among his most prominent research works uh, is editor, the environment of Arab electronic journalism, the context of development and prospects and the power of social media, and as author, chapters and books such as Al Jazeera narrate a story in the studies, as well as the power of social media and its impact on conventional media networks and the political environment. Dr. Mohammed al -Rashi. Thank you, Dr. Hala. Thank you so much. I would also like to say, uh, thank the uh, presidency of this conference for the support we've received uh, during uh, the preparation of this uh, paper. We also thank the scientific communi uh, c committee that allowed us to attend this conference. Uh, we will uh, revolve around a number of uh, points or the th uh, theoretical points and then the conceptual network and the ideological uh, Israeli discourse um, manifestations and the social media strategy to uh, further the dominance of the Israeli uh, discourse. As we all know this, Social media networks exercise uh, the, uh, what is called a discourse power on interactive uh, discourses. So the activity of the users is uh, or follows a certain hierarchy according to their access uh, or accessibility. So we have a pref preferential accessibility or a more restricted accessibility to the discourse. <coughs> so we will see in this discrepancy or in this difference uh, users that are contributing to producing this discourse and some others will be found on the margins of the discourse and of the social media. As such, the control of uh, the indicators of the discourse, its manifestations, and its producers will be uh, better controlled. So the more restricted the access, the more restricted or the more limited uh, the users use. Some of them would be banned from or prohibited from uh, uh, publishing um, a story, a um, cartoon, or even reposting. So this is limited or restricted access. So the preferential access would be one of the main elements to continue this dominance. Because the discourse, just like uh, precious social resources that is very valuable for the authorities, so it cannot be allowed to everyone. The access to discourse cannot be allowed to everyone. So this dichotomy or this these two things, restricted and preferential access, explains to us how social media networks are trying to dominate the rhetoric. So you would find users their access to uh, social media networks very uh, limited, very restricted, while other users are allowed just regular access. 
we look at the example of the users from the Israeli army who have preferential access and they have employed a number of opinion uh, writers and journalists to turn social media networks to a war zone or a war uh, space, like a virtual war space. And they, they, can't, they militarize the digital space. So you see them publishing their own stories and uh, war stories. We're talking about the war on Palestinians in different circumstances and on different occasions. The example I worked on was from Israeli writers and journalists, as you can see, a number of accounts, eight accounts, for journalists, J. Mayam and A.D. Cohen, these are researchers and journalists, as well as Israel in Arabic page, uh, and uh, Adrai, Khidai Adrai. So this happened between 20, uh, Jan 2022 and the end of 2022. It went uh, in parallel with the uh, operation on Gaza and the killing of uh, Al Jazeera and journalist Shirin Abu Aqli. And here, uh, I'm going to uh, skip the methodological uh, vision uh, of the paper, which will be published later on. So we've relied on a number of concepts to analyze this hypothesis, which is the privileged or restricted access by talking about the concept of the new algorithm power. We're talking about a number of mathematical uh, equations uh, translated into codes and with the input of data from the real world with a specific aim or objective. So they have a clear function. So they do not come from the void. Uh, they are born out of the intellectual structure of those who create these algorithms. So it is not born out of uh, a void. So we're talking about the decision-making algorithms through a number of uh, softwares that are analyzed and are very effective. So by algorithms, we're talking about a certain uh, text, a certain discourse that, uh, that carries a number of concepts. So this linkage between the algorithm and the text refers us to a discourse uh, practice because the text is a discourse practice or rhetorical practice. So it doesn't come out of the void. It's not a, an absolute mathematical equation. It comes with specific goals. And I think Dr. Fatma Zahra has elaborated on it. And she has a research paper in Lubab uh, journal. She spoke about uh, uh, social engineering or public social engineering or social engineering to the public. So this concept is linked, as we mentioned, with a lot of uh, intellectual uh, load, which um, directs or orients the whole process. We skip the details to say that algorithms in general are able when linked to the rhetorical practice to give us uh, options, categorization, uh, sorting, and identification of issues and topics, and do other functions as well. 
Amongst the concepts that we've resorted to is the discourse uh, uh, or rhetorical dominance, ideological and rhetorical dominance. So this is a cognitive uh, framework that uh, goes in different directions, and the ideology is only ideology when linked to dominance. So it has to have the dominance or hegemony element to it for it to become an ideology. So it is symbolic and has a meaning as much as it works uh, within a specific social and community frameworks to build for something as long as it doesn't cater to those conditions. For example, the study by John Thompson a very well-known so sociologist. So he links ideology to the need uh, uh, for dominance. So by dominance we mean directing a discourse towards one specific direction. So after this introduction, we are going to present to you the Israeli discourse, ideological discourse, and its patterns through examining the sample I've mentioned, around eight Israeli accounts that I showed you on the screen. What's noteworthy here in the Israeli discourse is that we will notice uh, it is built on what some researchers call ideological square, where twin van Dyck, uh, that twin van Dyck analyzed thoroughly. As you notice, it focuses on self and an attempt at uh, uh, highlighting or accentuating the positive aspects, the positive uh, characteristics while trying to minimize the others. And here they try to highlight the Israeli self positively while also depicting the Palestinian uh, self or identity very negatively. And this goes to show the conflict between the Israeli and the Palestinian selves or identities. So this polarization furthers the power of the speaker, its ethical dominance, while also minimizing and undermining the confidence in the uh, other and the other identity. Amongst the typologies of this Israel, uh, Israeli ideological discourse is the ideology of legitimization. This is one of the categorizations of uh, John Thompson. In order to build uh, relations of dominance and preserve them by showcasing the legitimacy of the causes raised in the Israeli discourse. What the Palestinians consider as occupation of their own land is viewed by the Israelis as a return of the Israeli people to their own land. So they're trying to legitimize the Israeli existence or presence through all the means. First, through very rational uh, basis by relying on international uh, law and international legitimacy decisions. That's the first condition. The second condition is the conventional basis, which is the religious uh, principles and beliefs, saying that the Israelis were the first people to occupy this land or to live in this land. And they try to legitimize their presence uh, through conventional means which are their religious beliefs. And uh, the third uh, criteria is the exceptional characteristics of Israel as a democracy amongst other countries. That's the first type of ideology. There is another type. Uh, by studying uh, this uh, rhetoric, uh, which is uh, 
not highlighting uh, uh, any resistance uh, movement. If you notice uh, in that uh, in uh, the uh, August 2022 aggression uh, of Israel against uh, Gaza, the victims uh, during that uh, uh, war was from uh, the resistance itself. Uh, so they're trying uh, to Uh, uh, we're trying uh, not to shed light on uh, the uh, facts, uh, uh, which is that uh, most of the victims uh, were from the uh, resistance. And if you notice, uh, there is also this uh, ideology of unification, which is the third type through the texts that I uh, analyzed, you would say, see that uh, this uh, pattern tries to depict uh, the assistance and support uh, to the Israeli army. So the unification of people behind the army and highlights the achievements uh, of the Israeli army. And this is what we have seen on BBC Arabic. So this attempt to unification is also unifying this uh, discourse. Uh, there is a totally op uh, an opposite uh, pattern that tries uh, to highlight how Palestinians uh, are living uh, in a tragedy in uh, Gaza. So this uh, is uh, something that uh, affects the psychology by highlighting the tragedy of uh, Palestinians. There is uh, also a five-winged uh, an attempt uh, to disregard the Palestinian uh, cause, uh, which was inexistent uh, for the Israeli rhetoric. Uh, while, uh, while uh, or when highlighting the fact that uh, uh, Palestine was under the uh, British colonization. So there is uh, a turning of facts here. So it's uh, as uh, if uh, what's happening in uh, Palestine is uh, 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 is considered or is seen and depicted as being part of uh, the what's happen what's happening in Israel, and therefore the Palestinians do not have the right to call for a state of their own. This is. Uh, a tweet that I would uh, like to uh, uh, highlight here with you, which says, uh, uh, crush them and crush them all about Palestinians. So we see here this rhetoric that is dominant in Israel. It leads us to say that all the journalists and the academics have their own newsroom. They have the same newsroom. They publish the same discourse and the same caricature. Let me move now to one last uh, point. And say that all these ideologies are what is known the Hasbara, which is uh, the Israeli promotion and advertising of what is happening uh, within Israel and uh, spread and published uh, abroad. 
One last point. Which is the heart of this research, which is the strategies adopted by social networks in promoting the Israeli rhetoric dominance. Within this uh, network, there is an attempt to try to lead to an overflow by all users. This flood of content within or a flood of the content is like a public mobilization for the producers of uh, discourse and rhetoric. If uh, Dr. Hala would give me one more minute to tackle another pattern of these strategies. We talked about the flooding in the content and the recycling of texts. You would find that all researchers and journalists are trying to promote the same discourse among themselves. Generally put, I would like to talk about uh, the uh, rhetorical manipulation strategy in these texts and the sample of my study, you would see that uh, Israeli researchers and uh, uh, journalists are trying to provide misleading and fake facts. And uh, I would uh, uh, like to elaborate further on what I mentioned uh, in the uh, Q&A session. I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Muhammad Raji. We move uh, now to Mr. Nigel Niamutumbo on accountability and transparency in social media and uh, the fight against uh, fake news. Mr. Nigel is a media development practitioner, currently serving as the head of a secretariat of a network of nine media professional associations in Zimbabwe and includes professional associations and support organizations. He has over a decade experience in media and freedom of expression development work, and he was involved in the revision of the African Commission on Human Rights on Human and People's Rights Declaration on Freedom of Expression and uh, Access to Information. He is uh, also influencing the Zimbabwean legal reform uh, framework. He also works as a columnist and contributor to the local weekly paper, The Standard. In Zimbabwe. We would like to uh, welcome you, Mr. Niamotumbu, and uh, we give you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> moderator, and uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, bringing together this particular discussion uh, at a time uh, that uh, indeed the, the Global South, as is the Global North, are grappling uh, with how to uh, hold our social media uh, accountable and how uh, we can be transparent on these platforms. As you may already know, uh, <coughs> we are, uh, uh, there's a global conversation around uh, TikTok uh, right now, uh, particularly with the uh, 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 European uh, Union the, uh, and, and also in the United States of America, part of which measures uh, uh, speak to uh, the, the challenges uh, that uh, social media 
uh, are posing uh, within, within the, the, the public sphere and the, within the communication sphere. My uh, submissions are largely informed uh, by Southern Africa uh, context um, and uh, seek uh, really to, to zoom in uh, from experience from that end. So in, in my discussion, I will just begin by breaking down uh, what seems to be the challenge. Um, I will use the COVID-19 context uh, as an example of uh, uh, this uh, a challenge around transparency and accountability uh, in social media. I'll try to uh, define some of the forces, uh, their fears and interests, uh, and also then begin to discuss uh, fact checking uh, as a means and a tool uh, that is uh, being uh, mooted or that is being uh, used in light of the existing realities, in light of the existing uh, uh, context, and uh, make a case for strengthening uh, journalism as a way of ensuring that uh, even though these uh, particular platforms in Southern Africa in particular are dominating and are the means at which uh, citizens are accessing information, they could uh, access uh, information that is credible, they could access information that they can hold the purveyors accountable, and indeed the use uh, of their data and information uh, could be transparent. Uh, so the, the first uh, uh, challenge that uh, my submission poses is that uh, uh, access to the internet uh, is uh, broadly defined in terms of access to social media. So in the morning session, you'll notice that there was uh, a conversation around how there is now increased usage of uh, uh, the internet, increased usage of social media. In the global south, uh, what is even driving the, the access uh, to the internet is access uh, to social media. And that on its own poses uh, two uh, fundamental problems. The first being the social media that the users are accessing uh, is, is not indigenously owned. Uh, the social media uh, that uh, uh, citizens are accessing uh, is also uh, uh, driven by uh, a, a commercial imperative, is also driven uh, by uh, a certain interests that are outside uh, the, the uh, consumers, that are outside uh, the, 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 the citizenry. So in, in essence, what you then have uh, in terms of trying to hold uh, or trying to strengthen accountability and trying to strengthen transparency uh, is a predomin the predominant dominance uh, of uh, uh, actors that the states or the, the nation states do not actually have control over. Um, and in essence, uh, we, 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 we remain now at, at the mercy and at the hands uh, of those that own uh, this social media. In uh, Southern Africa in particular, uh, you find that it, uh, the, the use, what's driving the use of uh, uh, social media is predominantly WhatsApp, uh, and it's predominantly uh, the, the companies that is owned by, by Meta. Then uh, the second challenge being the unintended consequences of this expanded uh, freedom of expression space. I think there's one fundamental question uh, that uh, Bruce poses around uh, whether indeed uh, we, we are participants or we, or we are consumers. And if we are indeed participants, to what extent uh, is our participation adding uh, a value or adding to the discourse uh, in, in, in so far as the public sphere 
is, is, is concerned. Or our participation uh, really pertains to a, a, a culture of consumerism, uh, really also pertains and relates uh, to uh, uh, us having another platform to convey hate, to have another platform to sustain uh, existing stereotypes, whether uh, stereotypes of race, whether of sexism, uh, homophobia, and, 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 and so forth. And then there's the challenge of an appetite uh, to control the information space, uh, in, uh, which include uh, uh, provisions that criminalize freedom of expression. And this uh, particular challenge uh, is further augmented by these unintended consequences of an expanded uh, freedom of, of expression space where uh, the, there is uh, the shrinking uh, of, of democratic space in the name of trying to address uh, the, the, the challenges that come uh, with the expanded freedom of expression space. And this intention to control and regulate uh, the, the information space uh, has its patterns uh, pre the internet era uh, through the introduction of uh, uh, statutory uh, regulatory frameworks and through uh, the, 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 the weaponization uh, of the law. And then there's also the challenge of uh, lack of transparency in use of personal uh, information and uh, broadly data. And this challenge also emanates from the, the first uh, problem where we, where, where well at least our access to the internet is driven by the access to social media. It is uh, those platforms that we neither control uh, nor, nor have dictated upon, yet they, they have uh, access, uh, you know, over, you know, our personal information, uh, access over uh, our movements, access uh, insofar as uh, our uh, behavioral uh, pattern online. And then the question of uh, uh, digital security uh, and the intention to address uh, cybercrime uh, is, is, another, is another challenge. So I, I submit in my, in my discussion um, the attempt to try and entrench accountability and transparency uh, by using the COVID-19 pandemic uh, dilemma that was uh, uh, posed there. In that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic presents uh, an interesting uh, case study around managing uh, the competing interest, particularly trying to define uh, and strike a balance between the democratic uh, regulation of social media uh, as, as it were, and managing uh, the, 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 the information. So in the global south, particularly in Southern Africa, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic became a, a, a period at which where we saw an introduction of uh, vague and uh, broad clauses uh, around most uh, governments introduced statutory instruments. And in these statutory instruments, um, there were uh, various provisions that were introduced targeting uh, social media. The intentions to uh, entrench accountability and transparency on social media had always been there, uh, but COVID-19 uh, then provided a perfect opportunity where uh, clauses as broad as uh, one having, you know, getting arrested for being a WhatsApp administrator or one uh, 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 possibly facing uh, a criminal, uh, you know, penalties for, for, for exercising uh, a view uh, on social media. And this then, you know, posed a, a, a challenge in now trying to uh, draw that delicate line uh, between uh, promoting transparency, promoting accountability, 
yet at the same time uh, uh, preserving our freedom of, 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 info, of expression. And therefore, they began to have minimum room uh, for, for academic debate, including in the medical sphere, as the, the information during that period or during the case uh, the, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, became uh, top down, uh, where uh, there was almost an information cohesion uh, as a means uh, to, to, to uh, hold uh, social media users accountable and as a means uh, to, to, to generate information. And the way uh, this rampant conspiracy theories uh, on social media, uh, including but not limited to influencers, uh, which, prom which prompted uh, these accountability uh, measures. Uh, fake news, although it is like an oxymoron, uh, because if it is fake, it can't be news uh, on the pandemic and, and measures on social media, uh, you know, really further polluted uh, the, 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 the information space, uh, thereby, you know, prompting uh, 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 measures uh, to, be, to be taken. So uh, what you then uh, began to, to notice uh, emerging uh, as, 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 as part of this trajectory uh, was the attempt by the various governments and by state actors uh, to, uh, to manufacture um, uh, co co consent. In other words, the, the power uh, that be offline uh, in, in its various you know, uh, manifest manifestations, whether uh, uh, commercial power, uh, military power, state power, uh, and, and, and so forth, began to, to take much more stake um, uh, online, uh, fueling, you know, this ideological polarization, uh, which took center stage at the expense of uh, uh, fact, at the expense uh, of truth, or at the expense of credible, uh, information. Uh, algorithms and influencers uh, were existing to affirm existing preferred debates. And what you would notice is people uh, normally would then access information that confirms their existing uh, biases. Uh, and thereby, social media merely just becoming uh, a new battlefield and instrument of uh, exercise of of uh, soft power. Uh, naturally, uh, in, the, in the global south, there's this uh, appetite of introduction of extreme measures, including you know, internet shutdowns, uh, throttling. Uh, throttling is now being used uh, more and more to try and disrupt uh, uh, some of these social um, uh, media platforms, and all this is, is in that attempt to, to manufacture uh, consent. And as I, uh, uh, you know, moving to, to the last slides, um, the, this, the forces are, are, you know, are predominantly uh, in the state and within the ruling elite uh, with the fears of losing control uh, over what is consumed uh, in the information space uh, but more so lately, the commercial imperative. I think uh, the, 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 the case of uh, uh, Uganda is, is, is quite telling, uh, as is uh, the case in some African uh, countries, where they also now want a slice of the cake uh, to say, yes, we, we understand. We have no control uh, over uh, the, these platforms. We have no control uh, over what is being consumed, but we can certainly want to also have uh, control uh, in, in so far as what you are making or what you are taking out uh, as resources. There are fears of, of privacy. Uh, I think the case uh, of TikTok at the moment is, is due to uh, the, 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 the privacy uh, issues as well as uh, security and interference. And in the global south, it's also a question of cultural norms and values uh, that uh, you know, augment or that make 
uh, 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 people which, uh, you know, are prompting uh, this um, accountability. So as, as I am uh, uh, wrapping up, uh, I, I make a submission uh, to say, I think in so far as holding social media accountable and, and promoting a culture of transparency, uh, we need to invest uh, in fact checking because disinformation, uh, or if you want fake news or, or misinformation uh, and, and so forth, it has short legs, it can be challenged in real time, uh, and there the is scope uh, for promoting a behavioral change. Uh, because I, I, I don't think we'll be at a stage uh, to uh, uh, advance the decolonization of platforms at this particular stage. But what we can uh, is to uh, support and invest uh, in, in, the, you know, uh, in changes in behavioral or in changes in patterns on how these are being used. Uh, and, and fact checking can actually also be a tool and form of promoting uh, uh, self-regulation. And it can only also thrive uh, through partnership with credible media. And through partnership uh, with the dominant uh, social media platforms uh, to say if they are going to be using algorithms, if they are going to be using AI, artificial intelligence, and, and so forth, it has to be on the basis of information that is credible. It has to be on the basis on information that is organically uh, driven and on uh, information that is uh, knowledge driven. Uh, and I also then make uh, the case uh, for, for strengthening credible uh, 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 journalism, uh, uh, recognizing that uh, lately we now have journalists that are more popular than the outlets they work for or than the uh, news media outlets that uh, we, we would know. And therefore, there is scope now to uh, begin to target those and equip them. Uh, invest in, in, in new forms of uh, media and journalism, including data journalism, uh, where we can uh, have new ways of packaging uh, news uh, and information. And partnership with uh, these big tech companies, uh, insofar as us uh, beginning to use credible information as the way of holding, uh, of strengthening accountability and transparency on social media. And, um, you know, alternative forms of social media regulation and strengthening the accountability mechanisms for the media, uh, restoring uh, credibility. I know UNESCO recently just had a conference around uh, the internet and how it can uh, be build trust. So my key conclusions uh, really are the need for partnerships and support for fact-checking as an instrument for building social media accountability, uh, enhanced transparency in making the social media space uh, a safe space for, for all, uh, and strengthening quality journalism as a critical agent of credible uh, information on social media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Niamatombo. Uh, we call upon Mohammed Bouzedi, a researcher who's going to who's going to speak about framing the issue of Ukrainian, Middle Eastern refugees and asylum seekers in the face of French press. He's a journalist and researcher specializing in communications and media, served as a senior lecturer at the Doha Institute of Graduate Studies. He also partnered with various Qatari government institutions as the media producer of media content. He is currently working on a PhD on protest movements in contemporary France by adopting a media approach. He obtained master's degree in media science and cultural studies and bachelor's degree in mass communications from Qatar University. We welcome Mr. Mohammed Bouzid. <laughs> Which is just really, you know, uh, uh, an important thematic that is, you know, uh, social media network and metabol and ideological polarizations, which is, you know, really an important an important topic. So I would like to share my uh, 
some of my findings with you uh, about concerning the framing of Ukrainian and Middle Eastern refugees and asylum seekers in the news of French pressure on Twitter. This is a correction of what you have in your, uh, 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 in your presentation. So this is a, the concern is was on the news, shared on, news, uh, on, on, uh, on Twitter accounts of uh, French, uh, French news people, said so not tweets, but news, the whole news. So I start by, by, uh, uh, by asking two main questions. The first of all has to do with the future, with the general features. So I asked what, what were the most frequently uh, reflected features during the coverage of Ukrainian and Middle Eastern refugees and asylum seekers across French news papers? And uh, the second, and second, and second qu question posed was how did the frames vary in the coverage of Ukrainian and Middle Eastern refugees and Middle, mid, mid, and, mid, the few, okay, for the Middle Eastern refugees and asylum seekers by French news papers. So to answer these questions, I need the methodology. The methodology used in this, uh, the methodology used here is the quantitative technique of content analysis uh, with the composite week sampling, which uh, resulted in two constructed weeks representative of six months period, uh, uh, which is the time frame of the study. Uh, the sample size uh, harvested uh, 306 news people and news articles and the unit of the analysis was the entire news, news article. Here are uh, the news outlet, uh, outlets I, uh, I used during the analysis. So the, uh, uh, first of all, the first newspaper is Le Monde, which, adhere, uh, which, ad, uh, which adheres a central leftist uh, uh, point of view. Uh, and uh, Le Figaro uh, from uh, uh, Liberation uh, leftist viewpoints. So uh, please remember these, uh, this, you know, uh, this diversity in terms of pol uh, political spectrums of each of the newspapers because you know, uh, as I go forward, you, ca you can just you know, remember what I'm talking about. I hired two coders to, uh, for, for the purpose of these studies, rivals and 14 uh, framing devices. Uh, the intercoder reli reliability for conducting a content analysis in media and communication studies. Because it takes on sample and sampling method, which results in this. You can see in the first, in the first two days, I harvested almost a third of, of the news, which, which were really, uh, uh, really important. And fluctuation goes all the way until less, and the mode issues longer stories. You can see here that the average length of uh, of uh, uh, each news people is, is really is really considerable. Uh, uh, Le Monde is uh, 1567, uh, Liberation is 10, 1077 in terms of length. Uh, for descriptive variables overall, there, there, there was a focus, a massive focus on Russ origins, as you can see here in the table, expense of uh, the Middle Eastern uh, uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers. Le Monde and Liberation were consistent of blaming government policies towards the Ukrainians and Lacroix blamed government policies toward the Middle Eastern RAF, which was really interesting here to decipher that uh, a Catholic newspaper uh, was uh, a slight, you know, uh, draw, uh, or drew uh, uh, attention uh, to cover uh, issues related to the Ukrainian uh, refugees and asylum seekers than the, the others. Uh, but the Figaro emphasized the disruption caused by the Ukrainian refugees and asylum seekers. Regarding the overall frame, uh, the overall frame sequences hope and contextual frames. Uh, and the least used frame was religion and morality. Uh, frame, so Freeman, uh, Freeman immigration used in six frames for a uh, newspaper. So this is uh, per, per a news uh, per a news uh, per uh, a news article. So here, as you can see, this is, you can just remember with me. Uh, you can see the numbers, uh, the, the percentage in the, the y-axis. Uh, it's above 60 percent, you know, in the best you know, for for the context. Uh, as compared to the Ukrainian, there is you know some some differences, a big differences, because here the, the you know the most used doesn't exist, doesn't exceed. 40%, so which, which is really uh, an important finding to, to have this is an overall uh, usage of frame. So here also the most used frame was contextual uh, and social consequences and action frame. 
and less extreme with the religion and morality. Freeman immigration news proved to be less diverse across all the newspapers compared to the Ukrainians at the expense of human interest and sympathy narratives that my influenced public attitudes toward the Middle Eastern refugees and asylums, asylum seekers. Regarding uh, uh, the Freeman analysis per uh, each news uh, articles uh, and uh, uh, per each newspaper, so overall there is a massive use uh, of frames or all or at least six framing categories at once per news story, as you can see here with Le Monde. Uh, with Le Monde, Le Figaro, and Liberation uh, used, uh, used most of the frames in the context of uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainian news uh, as compared to La Croix, which was quite moderate in framing, uh, in framing the Ukrainian race, which, which is uh, uh, really an important finding here to, to underline. Regarding, the, uh, regarding the, uh, the Middle Eastern, uh, the Middle Eastern uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers news, you can see the verses that the country, La Croix, was, was highly concerned with the, with the, to, to cover uh, the issues related to the Middle Eastern refugees and asylum seekers uh, more importantly than did uh, its, uh, its uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, uh, and namely Le Monde, Le Figaro, and uh, Liberation. With growing interest of Liberation here, uh, that's found uh, to, be, to be quite, you know, uh, drawing more attention on, uh, on, uh, uh, on framing the, the events related to the Middle Eastern uh, Rust uh, News. So uh, to recap, the, the, the events of, of immigration news was uh, was prominence across all uh, across all the newspapers, with some fluct fluctuation in terms of uh, of uh, the number of news harvested in each uh, in each sample day, uh, and uh, and also there was an over focus on uh, refugees and asylum seekers' uh, origins and the blame of the government's policies toward the Ukrainian uh, refugees and asylum seekers at the expense of the Middle Eastern, as I, as I said before. So uh, the French press preferred the Eastern European uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers at the expense of the Middle Easterns. Uh, concerning the framing, the framing analysis, so the most used frames was uh, uh, where conflicts, action, uh, social consequences, hope and contextual frames uh, as compared to, uh, to the Ukrainian side, uh, the, uh, the Middle Eastern side, which were contextual social consequences and action uh, frames. Uh, Le Monde, Le Figaro, and Liberation were consistent in their strategies despite the distinct ideological spectrums with significant differences, with diverse content, with the conflicts and societal tenets overemphasized. La Croix, the, cal the, Catholic, peop uh, the Catholic people uh, focused mainly on uh, or showed uh, a concern about the Middle Eastern uh, refugees and asylum seekers with the moderate framing of the Ukrainians and uh, contextual and action were emphasized mostly. Uh, the bottom lines are, except for li libera li liberation, French newspapers were cautious to blame the government policies of reception, deportation of refugees and asylum seekers groups, uh, especially the Middle Easterns and fresh news, uh, news reported functioned within presets of stereotypes and cultural paradigms, a tradition that could be fostering negative attitudes toward these groups. And despite all of that, uh, all of that, uh, old newspapers showed significant differences in between them uh, uh, when, uh, when considering uh, the, the frequency of use of frames. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. We have 15 minutes for questions. Already, I'm sorry. So we will take a number of questions. And 
the name of God. I want to ask you 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 to ask I have a question for you, and I would like to thank you for the excellent uh, presentation you put in, an excellent uh, analysis of the rhetorical uh, ideology, especially uh, in the context of Israeli discourse, one of the most important causes for us in the Arab world. Uh, I wanted to, to uh, raise the issue of how the Israeli discourse changes facts and truth. And a number of times, such news or such propaganda doesn't last. Despite that, non-persuasive communication continues with the audience. So how does the social media interact with such a type of discourse? I think just like lies uh, have uh, are short-lived, the same for propaganda. How uh, is the social media interacting with such propaganda? I think at the end of the day, those lies are very short-lived. سؤالي الثاني لسيد نايجل نياموتومبو تحدثتم عن الأخبار الملفقة والمضللة ومساءلة المجتمع الأخبار المضللة قد ظهرت أهميتها لا سيما في الأوقات الحساسة الاستفتاءات الانتخابات ولكن هناك مشكلة هنا وهي أن الأخبار المضللة هي مفيدة بالكثير من المواقع الإلكترونية. complicated. How can we build a civilian society of defenders defending the truth, defending the reality, defending the the actual, you know, the reality, the 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 truth. How can we build a civilian society of truth defenders uh, apart from the state institutions and the the formal organizations that uh, many times they are uh, spreading fake news uh, thank you very much thank you to fatima Thank all the panelists. And I have a question to Dr. Mohammed Adraj, uh, Mohammed Erraj, actually, regarding the lies that are presented to the media. Isn't there a full fledged mechanism or system? Uh, that the governments are working uh, for, not only through the media, and they all support one another. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about an international political decision. So who holds the authority? Who uh, is the decision maker? So here lies the issue, how to influence them. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I'm a student of Hanin Zayed. Hanin Zayed, student from Qatar University. Press on TV. 
I would like to ask a question to Dr. Mohammed Er Rashi. The first question. From your perspective, sir, when will the social media networks stop uh, fomenting the hate speech and when will they come a tool to build peace? The second question. The Israeli Knesset is today voting a law to uh, apply a capital punishment on Palestinian uh, detainees. Uh, my question is to in whose interest are uh, international laws um, drafted? I would do an presentation in fact. I mean just l uh, have just one question for all of you if you like individually or collectively to answer. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the extremely important issues and challenges that all of you have raised from different perspective in fact cannot be well addressed if we ignore the fact that media capitalism and social media capitalism, uh, social media power and media power are a manifestation of media, media capitalism. Again, social media power is a manifestation of social media uh, capitalism that struggles against transparency, accountability, diversity of ideologies, diversity of voices, equalization, respect of others, and also struggle to perpetuate the uh, current and existing powers and inequality between those who have and those who have not. This is the question I hope that you can uh, answer collectively or individually. Yes, take two more questions. There is one there. Thank you very much. Uh, my question actually is for Mr. Nigel. Um, s as we know, search engines powered by AI are now on the rise. For example, Microsoft Bing and, uh, of course, ChatGPT. And what I want to know is how will this affect the credibility and accountability of news in the future? Because a lot of journalists will be using ChatGPT as a source of information because now people say that it's more trusted than Google and other normal search engines. So I would like you to talk and comment on how those search engines will be affecting the future of credibility of news. Thank you very much. One more question and we have somebody over there. She was raising her hand a long time. We thank the organizers for this conference. Now, in terms of the types of Israeli discourse, he mentioned a number of ideologies followed by this discourse. Including the forced disintegration uh, discourse and the discourse that uh, uh, consolidates the elements or the components of the Israeli community. My question. In view of these studies, are there any ideologies, are there any tools or means that the 
Arab media can use in order to fight such a discourse? Thank you. My last question. لدي سؤال للسيد Thank you. Yes. Um, before I hand it over to the speakers, I just have one question. Uh, because I'm the moderator, I have to ask a question. So, uh, Mr. Bruce, um, I have a question uh, for you about your um, about your proposition that we, um, especially in Africa, we have to go back to our traditional traditional media and traditional communication systems. Uh, my question or concern: How do we? Uh, I, I want to hear your thoughts about how do we ensure that we are not perpetuating another um, issues of social injustices. Uh, for example, I mean, media, traditional media and traditional communication system has always been contested um, arena. And people, I mean, we know that even within Africa as a global or within the global south, there are uh, power dynamics and power relationships. So how do we make sure that if we go back to the pre-social media that we ensure that the people who were traditionally excluded from the mainstream narratives, they have a voice. Thank you. Um, I think who wanna start? Mr. Muhammad, Dr. Raji, you had the... Shukran on the with the I uh, would like to thank everyone uh, for uh, interacting uh, with my presentation. It would be difficult for me to answer the questions uh, one by one. However, allow me to give some general uh, observations uh, in brief. Uh, through the research uh, outputs uh, as part of this conference, uh, this these outputs will give uh, answers uh, to some of uh, your questions. In my study, we noticed that, that uh, platforms in general, as Mitch Mitchell Fogel say, is uh, the uh, a social ownership of discourse. Other uh, researchers, such as uh, Twin, Twin Van Dyke, uh, uh, used other uh, expressions in relation to the use of social media. Some media allow such access, and they allow a category of users to own the discourse, and here lies the risk. The way there are restrictions against some categories. Some people call that digital discrimination, preventing some users from uh, taking part in the production of uh, this discourse. This highlights discrimination against uh, this category and uh, prevent preventing it uh, from uh, having their voice uh, heard. There are some Palestinian uh, research centers that are trying to uncover 
discrimination against uh, Palestinians. Uh, there are uh, several stories uh, that were published in relation to preventing Palestinians uh, from uh, taking part in the content and discourse production. C how can we put an end uh, to hate speech? This hinges uh, on several uh, factors, including, first and foremost, uh, uh, culture in uh, communities and societies, in addition to education. There should be a media education within uh, curriculum for they can uh, mitigate some of the risks in this relation. I uh, will uh, stop at this uh, level and uh, give it uh, to the other speakers if they would like to comment. Nati al-Kalima ila Nigel lil-Ijaba. Shukran. Uh, media education in also uh, a point that I had, I actually just noted it down as uh, media literacy uh, because it is something that uh, definitely would vest power uh, in the citizen, would vest power uh, in the consumer uh, and will, will indeed uh, enhance uh, accountability because if one is media literate, if one is able to uh, deceive uh, what is credible from what is not, uh, if one is able to deceive uh, between an opinion in the free expression market uh, and from what is uh, actually obtaining what is reality, uh, then that uh, uh, particular citizen will be able to uh, 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 push back some of the, the issues that we're discussing. Uh, there were uh, questions around uh, fake news uh, being uh, profitable, which uh, could uh, uh, somewhat be linked um, uh, with uh, uh, media capitalism. And in my submission, I would uh, perhaps want to debunk a certain myth uh, that has been uh, sustained and carried uh, a lot in media discourse. Uh, myths such as sensationalism sells, if it bleeds, it sells, uh, and that, you know, if it is able to uh, uh, generate a, a critical hype, uh, it, it, it sells. It may uh, perhaps sell, but not in, 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 in beyond um, any, you know, beyond any distance. It's not, it's not sustainable. Uh, it is clickbaiting exists pretty much for, for a very short period, uh, and it's perhaps easy come, uh, 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 easy go. And how we are only able uh, to, to build uh, that civil resistance is through media literacy, is through empowering uh, uh, citizenry, and it is through engagement, engagement with those that are uh, owning these platforms, engagement with those that are drivers of content uh, within, within these platforms. Uh, because what we've got is a real dichotomy uh, uh, of, you know, those that were always manufacturing content uh, pre-social media, those that uh, used a, a top-down approach uh, insofar as uh, the information discourse was concerned. Now we have an opportunity where a, 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 a citizens can be empowered, can be literate uh, to, to, to push back. And it, it is actually a power that we can, if we invest in them being able to build that resistance, uh, we can be able to uh, have cleaner uh, uh, spaces for, for engagement. And then lastly, on the question of uh, uh, credibility uh, with the rise of new uh, search engines, with the rise of uh, uh, new techs, uh, artificial intelligence, and so forth. I think when I made the submission that we need to uh, strengthen uh, journalism, 
uh, I need to just expand more that we need to strengthen professional journalism, which is anchored on the science of verification. Uh, if information gathering is going to just take a search engine uh, without the necessary uh, means of verifying, without the necessary means of investigating, without the necessary uh, means of ensuring that there is a balance uh, in the discourse, it ceases to be journalism. It becomes uh, just, you know, the free expression uh, and, 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 and uh, the, the marketplace of various opinions. But if journalism is going to remain a science of verification, if it's going to remain a, a, a science that balances uh, contesting and interprets the global uh, and national questions of the day, then uh, whether these search engines are, and artificial intelligence are going to expand, we will still have a space that is protected for information that could be credible. Thank you. Mohamed Bouzaidi. Okay, just say, uh, I just I would like to add uh, some thought to your your question you raised, uh, Paul. Uh, I think you know, it's not just for uh, is is a manifestation of a capitalism. A social media is a manifestation of a of a capitalism of the haves and the have nots, the have most and the have least, uh, at the expense of the have least. And this is this is a big concern. But we have to take it from this from this side. We have to see the social media at double salt, uh, double salt, uh, 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 double edged salt, uh, which can counter the hegemony of those institutions by creating new content, cloning people with each other, and uh, countering countering such a uh, meta narrative that exists within within the media, uh, the media. Uh, well, the landscape, or can you, you name it, uh, and 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 profiting those people because you know they, they need money to survive to make their, their, their ends meet. So this is this is you know the danger of uh, the danger and the benefits of social media in uh, uh, in a really capitalistic era that we are, that we cannot deny its effect and its influence on people's life. Thank you. Last but not least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had, uh, there were three questions. I'll, I'll begin with your question, um, Professor Ahmadu. Now, um, I think what we are seeing here is nothing new, right? Uh, as you rightly pointed, um, media capitalism is the order of the day. Um, um, I mean, media capitalism as uh, Marx uh, uh, um, uh, suggested uh, would not work particularly where there's no legitimacy. The way it works is first, and we actually see it also today with, with social media. When social media came or, you know, when it was introduced to all of us, uh, uh, we were meant to believe that it was a matter of, you know, uh, um, having, uh, s uh, staying in contact with family, uh, uh, you know, finding information. We never thought about disinformation, mass inf misinformation, and the rest that has come as a direct result of social media presence. I think it came uh, uh, to us um, under the pretext that it was, it was uh, legit and uh, it was going to help us. Uh, and so once the legitimacy was gained, uh, then I think um, it's easy for uh, social media for 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 um, uh, for social media to have uh, hegemonic powers on us because obviously, um, yeah, we, we we tend to be uh, on the consuming side. But uh, as I said also in my talk, I do not just think that it is just a matter of blaming the you know the the capitalists or the media capitalists uh, um, I think the question is also what are we doing with that and uh, I think societies particularly in the global south um, uh, we tend to uh, maybe not be very critical particularly in realizing that 
it started with uh, colonialism and it was repackaged as global uh, globalization and we uh, uh, you know there are more people here in the in the south that actually think that um, uh, a social media or globalization is actually much better for them this does not and going to the uh, question from the other student does not mean that i do not see the benefits of course of social media or of globalization but you know i, I would uh, it would be almost like waste of time for for me to come here to to promote globalization or to say the good things about globalization i think what our job is to critique uh, uh, is to be with the masses the people who actually are affected by um by these policies so in as much as i actually see the benefits i think uh, the key ro my jo i see my job more as uh, standing with the people who are actually uh, um, affected, who continue to be marginalized by uh, policies that are instituted as a direct result of these technologies. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, going to your question, uh, I do not really think that um, there is w one size fits all. There is one solution to all this. Um, the only the only reason why I see going back to the basics as maybe a potential solution is just simply because it's something that is tried and tested that we have actually lived and that we have actually seen, but that I think current generations or even people of today seem to be despising. They do not really realize that, uh, or we don't seem to realize that. You know, we have actually lived uh, uh, you know uh, successful lives before uh, you know these technologies and uh, and I feel that it is really important to pay allegiance to the communities where we also come from because my problem is also the fact that all these solutions if you look at for example at this conference uh, um, it's only the elites you know, it's it's the academics, the the educated, uh, uh, the people who seem to be leading this discourse. Where are the people who perhaps uh, have never been to school or who have never been, uh, have never went to university? I think these are the people that we also need to talk to because when it comes to disinformation or misinformation, they are the ones who are actually uh, on the forefront of sharing. Uh, 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 this, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this uh, fake news or these vices. So I think there is need to have a collaboration between all uh, um, parts of a society, and not just to, for us to think or to stay in our bubble to think that we have the answers. Because I firmly believe that the answers are somewhere else, but not in this room. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, the uh, panelists and uh, the participants uh, for enriching uh, this session with their input and questions. I call upon each and everyone here to continue this uh, uh, debate during the uh, uh, lunch break because uh, this uh, uh, session, if anything, has raised uh, several questions lunch and um, we will be back at 2.10. Uh, the lunch break and we will uh, resume our uh, second session at 2.20 sharp. What is the role of these networks in ideological polarization? How can they be used to promote democracy and human rights? Social media networks and ideological polarization